Okay. I'm fixing to do a... What the hell do you call those type of videos? Will you... Critique video. Now this video about Augustine. Did Augustine corrupt the church with Gnostic doctrine? As this video is played, I'm going to interrupt and say my two cents. Try to get to the bottom of this. I'm playing a fucking video. And even now, already. Son of a bitch. In 1979, a woman was found after being murdered. One year later, a man found himself in court accused of the crime. After a trial, a jury found the man guilty of murder and sentenced him to life in prison. After serving 27 years behind bars, new DNA evidence arose which showed that the man doing time could not have committed the crime. Oh, get on the story. The case was reopened and an innocent man was exonerated. Now, when it comes to the free will case, in the minds of many, it's, it's, it's closed. But what if the verdict handed down by ecclesiastical courts and ecclesiastical councils is the wrong verdict? What if we've come to the wrong conclusion? What if we reopen the case and re-examine our positions in light of the earliest church history? Now, when it comes to the free will controversy, most people think of Calvinism versus Arminianism. Those who are more knowledgeable of history think of Augustinianism versus Pelagianism. But very few people go beyond Augustine Scream and look at the early confusion. church versus Gnosticism. I said that from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I mean it, God. Screw you. If you're real, why is that, why is there all this confusion? In a day when Augustinian and Calvinistic theology has dominance, the position of free will is considered to be heretical. But in the days of the early church, it was orthodox to believe in free will, and it was considered heretical to deny it. Preach it, brother. One of the major differences between the early church and the Gnostics was their view of human nature. The early church believed that man had free will by nature and could choose between good and evil. The Gnostics, on the other hand, believed man was created with such a ruined constitution that he was forced to sin by necessity of his nature. Busob said that those ancient writers in general say that Manichaeans denied free will. The reason is that the fathers believed and maintained against the Manichaeans that whatever state man is in, he has the command over his own actions and has equally power to do good or evil. Okay, okay, okay. Let's, let's insert some scripture. Man has a choice to do good or evil. Yes, yes. I believe that. But Paul also says, when I would do good, evil is there. So that the, the good I would do, I do not. The evil I would not do, that I do. For I know that in my flesh, that is, for, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present, but the ability to do it is not there. Something like that in Romans. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Calvinists say we're totally depraved. We get we cannot even want to be saved unless God works work in us. Why then are we commanded to seek God? I, my personal con conclusion is that we're all tainted by the sin of Adam. Sin. We're all tainted by sin. No matter how good we want to do, sin is always going to be the the drag us down. The law of sin and death, for the law of spirit, uh, the life, of, uh, the law of life and uh, the spirit as of uh, the spirit, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free the, for the law of sin and death. No matter how much you want to do good, that's no matter how much you want to badly you want to fellowship with God and do good works for God. There's an Incrossable chasm that you cannot cross. No matter how much you want to, you cannot cross this chasm. 
The only way it can be bridged is with the cross of Jesus Christ. His death is shed blood and his new and the new birth. And then you can do do true bear fruit under righteous did your work then as Jesus said, He that doeth truth come to the light that it may be manifest that his deeds are wrought in God. Anything you offer in the flesh is gonna be tainted by your sin by the the stain of sin which we all inherit from Adam. So we're commanded to seek God. We're commanded to good to to do works of righteousness. We cannot do that without seeking God and God working the work in us first. But you you can you can have the desire to seek God. And that's a good thing, but no Jesus said there's none good but God. Why call us out we good? So let me get my thoughts together. When the uh Jesus said to the Pharisees, No Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, except your righteousness that seed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the end of the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees were doing good works, but they were not they were come from the own own sinful natures. They were not coming through the Spirit of God. That the righteousness that you are acquired to have that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is the righteousness that which comes spontaneously from within. That's the because you do the righteousness because you got a new birth from God, from God's Spirit, and you just you, because it's a wonderful, full of light reality. You want to do good because why? Because Jesus, because God. And that's why I want to do good, not to get into heaven, not to get rewards. If that's the reason you're doing it, that's not that righteousness is crap. But if you righteousness, if you want to do it, if you're doing it because you just want to do that, because of, because you love God, then that's the righteousness that God requires, and there's only one way to get it through the new birth, which there's only one way to get the new birth: be forgiven of your sins by the cross of Christ, and be redeemed to God, and crucify your sinful nature through the cross of Christ. Let's get back on the... W.F. Hook said, The Manichaeans so denied free will as to hold a fatal necessity of sinning. Lyman Beecher said, The free will and natural ability of man were held by the whole church. Natural inability was to that of the pagan philosophers, the Gnostics, and the Manichaeans. In the days of early Christianity, there were many Gnostic sects denied the freedom of man's will. One of them was Marcionism, started by Marcion. But one of the greatest competitors to the early church was Manichaeanism, started by Mani, also known as Manes, who was a Persian philosopher. In the Acta Archelae, also known as the Disputation with Manes, the early church debated the founder of Manichaeanism. The early church chose Archelius, who was a bishop in the early church, to represent their position, which was that God created us with free will. Mani, on the other hand, who is the founder of Manichaeanism, took the position that man's nature was so corrupt and so ruined that free will was not part of our constitution. At the end of the debate, the judges ruled in favor of Archelius and stated that man does in fact have a free will and ruled against Manny's position that our nature was so depraved and corrupted that liberty was not part of our constitution. Archelaus said, All the creatures that God made, he made very good. And he gave to every individual the sense of free will, by which standard he also instituted the law of judgment. Our will is constituted to choose either to sin or not to sin. And certainly whoever will may keep the commandments. Whoever despises them and turns aside to what is contrary to them shall yet without doubt have to face this law of judgment. The judges responded, there can be no doubt that every individual, in using his own proper power of will, may shape his course in whatever direction he pleases. The debate between Archelius and Manny was at the core of the debate between the early... 
Okay. You can choose to obey God, to try to obey God, but when you do that, you're going to find something's wrong inside. Something's flawed inside. Something's terribly wrong inside. You want to do good, but something's dragging you down. It's called sin, dragging you down. You want, like Paul, the good I desire to do, I do not, and the evil I do want not want to do, I do. Your mind can be enlightened by the Spirit of God to what's right, good, and this can cause you the desire to seek God, and God commands you to seek Him, but once He passed from death unto life, there's this great chasm that you just cannot cross no matter how much you want to to reach God you got you you got to find God first and then the inner ability will be given to you to do righteousness and then you will truly be able to choose between good and evil as it, as it stands now you can choose to follow your own evil nature and go far descend further and further into death or seek God until he you find him and when you find him then you then you will have the nature that desires to do righteousness. It says in the book of John first John, he that is born of God cannot sin. That's new. That's new nature because new. Once new nature takes control, Jesus takes over the driver's seat. He is crucified. You died in Jesus. You and your sinful nature. That part of you that is terribly flawed has died on the cross of Jesus Christ and been resurrected with Jesus Christ. So God declares you raised from the dead with Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is absolutely righteous. And now He's going to work in you to kill that old sinful nature, so that. One day you will you, be saved and you will not even have the desire or ability to sin. Yes, you still got a sinful nature. You can choose to follow your sinful nature if you're born again and sin. But uh, if you're truly born again, then born again nature is going to rise up and say, Hey, no, 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 no. And make you miserable. For the flesh lusts is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary, so that you cannot do what you were brought to do, Paul, uh, Apostle Paul writes. You have a, you have a nature in you that is bent towards sin, can do no good. Oh, you can do, oh, you can, you, you can do good things, but no, that, like Jesus said, there's none good but God. To be, you gotta be good enough. You works have gotta be good enough. And uh, they're not, they might be good on a human level, but they're not good on God's level unless they come from God. Unless your works come from God. And the new birth is when God imparts his nature to you, your nature. So that your works can you be brought and bought God, as Jesus said. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are rotten God. You cannot. Just because Jesus said, uh, you cannot feed the homeless, feed the Christians who are starving, do good works. You can, you can do those sort of good works. That's not going to save you. You got to be saved first, be truly able to do those good works that God requires. The early church and Gnosticism. Uh, the church actually feared that Gnostic doctrine would infiltrate the church. And therefore, this debate was of extreme importance. Gnostic doctrine was so dangerous, even in the times of the apostles, that the apostle John took up his pen against it in his epistles. First John says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they're not of us all. He also goes on to say, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that the spirit is an anti-Christ, whereof you have heard it is now should come. Okay, okay, okay. First John says, 
Uh, they went out from us that it may be manifest. They were never truly of us. Now, someone was saying, if you can do to the good, do good and evil, how is it uh, once you, if you are saved, you cannot choose to go out and do evil? Would you lose your free will when you get saved? No. But if you are truly saved and truly born again, if you start to do evil, that new birth is going to step in and say, hey, whoa. Hold it, uh, stop, you stop that. You do not, this is not who you are, truly, truly are. You are born of the spirit. Your old self, your old sinful self has died in Christ. I'm not, I, you, you, the Holy Spirit's going to say, you belong to me. I'm not going to, going to lose you. Now, now what, if you can do, uh, now if you can lose your salvation, the way you can lose it is this by stubborn continued resistance of this against the Holy Spirit who lives inside you by choosing by fault blasting in the sin until you get to the state where you all you want to do is sin you don't and you no longer want God then you can turn your back on him and then the spirit well your new nature will die because the Holy Spirit will depart from you forever that's if you can lose your salvation. Can you or can't you? I just don't freaking know. Right now, I believe you can. Come, and even now, already is in the world. I think I've lost my salvation. I'm trying, I've renounced Jesus, and I'm trying to get it back. I just can't get him back. He went on to say, in Second John, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. The Gnostics were teaching that the flesh was in and of itself sinful, which is why they denied that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and why the Bible called them deceivers and anti-Christ. In Gnosticism, sin was a substance of the body which is inherited at conception. But in the early church, sin was a choice of the will which is originated by the individual. Now the Bible actually came against this Gnostic view that sin was a substance of the body. But the Bible can endorses the early church. For example, in Philippians 4.3, we read this. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the others, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. In Philippians, Paul mentioned his fellow laborers in the gospel, whose names were written in the book of life. And he specifically names Clement. Now, history knows this man, who was Paul's companion, and was even endorsed by the scriptures themselves, as Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome taught the doctrine of free will. Clement said that free will was given because he who is good by his own choice is really good. But he who is made good by another under necessity is not really good because he is not what he is by his own choice. Clement said, it is therefore in the power of every one, since man has been made possessed of free will, whether he shall hear us to life, or the demons to destruction. Clement said, For no other reason does God punish the sinner, either in the present or in the future world, except because he knows that the sinner was able to conquer, but neglected to gain the victory. Ignatius was another figure in the... Oh my goodness, that just said a mouthful of gourmet caviar. Oh my goodness, that was delicious. Okay, let's go back and see that. Okay. He who does good by his own choice is really good. Yeah. But to do good... You did, but to truly, if you're not saved, you can choose to do good and you will be judged by your works. On Judgment Day, like Cornelius, he gave alms to the poor. He was a good, just man, a righteous man. But what did the angels tell him? Go send for Peter, and he shall tell you what you must do. Because his goodness was not good enough. He had to be born again of the Spirit after hearing Peter's message of salvation in Jesus Christ. 
and then his good deeds. His good deeds came from his knowledge of the scriptures, his incomplete knowledge of the scriptures. But now that he was born again, he had passed from death into life. You can choose whether to remain in sin and follow his sinful nature with, with reckless abandon, or you can realize something's wrong inside. Something's, something's not right. There's got to be, there's something missing in my life. And try to find that. Seeking, you, see, you shall find. Knocking, it shall be open to you. Asking, you shall receive. You can f try to find your way, as John MacArthur says, that narrow gate. And once you're in the, and you need, and you can choose to, and find it, and enter into life. So that's your, that, if you're a sinner, that's your choice. Either just follow your sinful nature with reckless and abandon and forget about God, or seek God until you find God. That's your choice. It's not what he is by his own choice. Clement said, it is therefore in the power of everyone since man has been made. Way, whether you were listening, well, hey, here's what happens. Here's how God gives you, true faith and repentance are a gift to God. You cannot repent, you cannot believe without God. But here's the way he does it. When God, through the Holy Spirit, comes, speaks to your spirit, makes you know he is real. But as a, in and out, you can't see him, so it's faith without sight. But you know, deep in your spirit, hey, something's wrong with my life. God's here. He's speaking to my spirit. He's knocking on my heart's door. And you, 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 because that 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 is that is how you are able to say yes or no. You ever you you get yeah, irresistible grace. You can't resist grace. How is it then? Stephen said to in the sermon, "You you you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did. So you do ye. If you can't resist God's grace." Oh, they say effectual grace. Oh my goodness! Thank you. you can create a thousand. I oh, forget it. But anyways, the more the story. What I'm trying to say is, when God becomes real to you, and this 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 is done when you hear the word of God preached. When God's word is preached, His Spirit comes down and speaks to your spirit through that word. And you know he's real, and you know you, you have a choice. Believe on Jesus, believe on God, and be saved, and enter through that narrow gate, or go my own way, and that's the choice you got. Made possessed of free will, whether he shall hear us to life, or the demons to destruction. Clement said, for no other reason does God punish the sinner either in the present or in the future world, except because he knows that the sinner was able to conquer, but neglected to gain the victory. Okay. Paul does say, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But how, how then is the sinner able to conquer under victory? By, believe on, by, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Ignatius was another figure in the early church. He was a disciple of the Apostle John and was martyred in the Roman Colosseum. He was actually eaten by lions. In contradiction to Gnosticism, Ignatius said that men were sinners not by nature, but by free will. Ignatius said, if anyone is truly religious, he is a man of God. But if he is irreligious, he is a man of the devil, made such not by nature, but by his own choice. Ignatius said, and there is set before us life upon our observance of God's precepts, but death as the result of disobedience, and everyone, according to the choice he makes, shall go to his own place. Let us flee from death and make choice of life. The Apostle John also had... You know, sometimes I get the impression that the early church fathers bleed. You know, you hear, you know, you hear so much that uh, of people, all you gotta do is be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're saved. That's only the that's only the beginning. Sometimes it seems like 
You say you, you are deemed God by the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiven of his sins. Yes. Uh, Not. You do. Remember, you can have that small pizza. Thank you. Tomorrow. The oven okay. The yeah, okay. Sometimes it seems, like I said, you're a deemed God. You're a deemed from death by God so, so that you can live a life of good works. But if you do it, the other Christians believe just because you were covered by the blood, if you did not let that inner grace within you work itself into a life of good work, deeds and love for God and your fellow man, you would forfeit your new birth when you died and you would go to hell. That's the impression I get from some of those early church fathers. Just because you were covered by the blood and born again, that was just the start. That didn't my, no, just because he, uh, you, you had to endure to the end. You had to let that work itself out in a conversation of godliness. Well, she didn't, well, she, when you died, you forfeited it. And you lost it and you went to hell. But then the king of the king, the, the flaw and star with that thing is what about the man who Paul delivers over the, the devil? That the spirit may be saved, that 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 the flesh may be destroyed, the body may be killed, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, when that man was living in unrepentant sin. You would think uh, such a man like that would go to hell unless what Paul was doing was delivering, delivering him over to the devil so that the devil would kill him before the man had sinned so much that he chose to turn his back totally on God and die and go to hell. But then the question is, if I was the devil and someone was delivered over into my hands, I would let, him, I would let that person keep sinning so that he could lose his salvation. I wouldn't kill him so I, he, he'd get a, get a free trip to heaven. I just don't fucking know. Also had a disciple named Polycarp. Polycarp. Jesus, are you really real? Are you really real, or is this all man-made? Was a personal friend of Ignatius and was also martyred in the Roman Colosseum. Polycarp had a faithful disciple named Irenaeus, and Irenaeus was also a teacher of free will. Irenaeus said. Men are possessed with free will and endowed with a faculty of making a choice. It is not true, therefore, that some are by nature good and others bad. Irenaeus said, Man is endowed with a faculty of distinguishing good and evil, so that without compulsion he has the power by his own will and choice to perform God's commandments. Irenaeus said, Man is possessed of free will from the beginning and God is possessed of free will in whom likeness man was created. Irenaeus said, This expression, How often would I have gathered thy children together, and thou wouldst not, set forth the ancient law of human liberty, because God made man a free agent from the beginning, possessing his own soul to obey the behests of God voluntarily, and not by the compulsion of God. Justin Martyr, was an early evangelist and apologist in the early church. He labored tirelessly for Christianity until he too was martyred in Rome. Justin taught that free will was an essential Christian doctrine. We have learned from the prophets, and we hold it to be true. How in the world do, do the Calvinists, how can the Calvinists, do the Calvinists even bother to read the writings of the early church father? Or does their history of Christianity stop in the 1500s with the Rev start in the 1500s with the Reformation? Are they willfully ignorant of what these early church fathers said? How in the how in the hell does the Calvinists explain away the teachings of the church father that you could forfeit your salvation and die and go to hell after you've been truly born again? How in the hell do how in the hell do they explain the way? Willfully, willfully blind. I was on. I had been brain. I was almost brainwashed by Calvinism in 2019. I had been brainwashed by the way of thinking until I read the early church fathers. But then, if God is blessing the Calvinists 
and Calvinists like Jonathan Edward say God told him in the spirit, I love you. All that I have, all that I have, Jesus told him, all that I have is thine. All that my father has is thine. All that my spirit is, no, all that I am is thine. All that my father is is thine. All that my spirit is is thine. How come God's not correcting their thinking if he is real? Or is it, that, that's what I'm saying. The only church fathers believe their way and receive the blessing of the Spirit of God. And the Calvinists believe their way and receive the blessing of the Spirit of God. Jesus, if you're real, why are you, why, why are you, why are you not leading Christians, whether it was 134 AD or 1934 AD, to one con conclusion? Are you even real? that punishment, chastisement, and rewards are rendered according to the merit of each man's actions. Otherwise, if all things happen by fate, then nothing is our own power. For if it is predestined that one man be good and another man evil, then the first is not deserving of praise and the other to be blamed. Unless humans have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, whatever they may be. Oh my goodness, that is a mouthful of caviar. I can hear the death and I can hear the nails being nailed in the coffin of Calvinism. And let's face it, John Calvin was not a righteous man. He killed he killed those who disagreed with him. He was a he was a freaking murderer. He killed heretics. There's this video by David Brousseau. Let me pull the video up. Okay, let me pull this video up. It's in this video. What the earth? You, hardly you need to listen to this video. The early church fathers did not believe in killing heretics. The early church fathers were returning their graves and they saw what John Calvin was doing, having heretics burned at the stake, witches burned at the stake. Christians living in the kingdom, uh, having positions in the kingdom of darkness, the kingdoms of the world, which is which all belong to Satan. The uh, after hearing this sermon, the simplicity and the beauty of what. Christianity was meant to be the Calvinist told him that totally missed it and even the Christians of the day totally miss it Okay, look at that freaking video So where's that where's my fucking video? Oh for neither would a man be worthy of praise if he did not himself choose the good, but was merely created for that end. Likewise, if a man were created evil, he would ever... not deserve punishment, since he was not evil of himself, being unable to do anything else than what he was made for. Okay, okay. I see some flaws in the slow. Okay. These these men are not taking taking into consideration that we are tainted by sin. We can choose to do good, but you know, if we choose to do good, that's not good enough. We need to be born again. They have to pass from life unto death, and then the good works that that we do, when they come from God within us, those works will last. If you do good works, if you choose to do good works and don't get saved, you'll be judged by those works of the great wide throne judgment, but you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So our nature, we can aspire. Man, the natural man, can aspire to go higher, does, does aspire to be good, but he'll never make it apart from... The new birth, which is uh, attainable only through 
for you and forgiven of your sins by the shed blood and death of Jesus Christ. And he is worthy of praise because he chose to humble himself and accept that his works are not good enough. The works of, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Paul says, having not my own righteousness, which is according to the law, but the righteousness of, which is according to the faith. The faith you get when you sense God's spirit approaching your spirit, knocking on your heart's door. When you exercise that faith God gives to you and say yes to God, he gives you a righteousness based upon Jesus Christ and his death and shed blood that reveals itself self and fruits of righteousness and uh, righteous living. Tertullian was another leader in the early church. He was an apologist who was known for his prolific writings. He was in perfect agreement with the early church on his teachings on free will. Tertullian said, no reward can be justly bestowed. No punishment can be justly inflicted upon him who is good or bad by necessity and not by his own choice. Tertullian said, you will find that when he sets before man <coughs> good and evil, life and death, that the entire course of discipline is arranged in precepts by God's calling men from sin and threatening and exhorting them. And this on no other ground <coughs> that man is free with a will, either for obedience or resistance. Method obedience. God. Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven, taking vengeance uh, uh, upon all them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you obey God today, by obey the, obeying the gospel and being born again, passing from death into life through the death and shed blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. When Jesus died on that cross, you and your all you are, your sinful nature, you died with him. And Jesus rose again. That's what's meant by Paul says, when Paul says, Die, I may know him in the power of his resurrection. You too, you and all your sinfulness, and that stand of sin that's within you dies. And the Holy Spirit comes in, fuses into your spirit. Yes? Good night, night. You too. Yes, sir. Not, and all the and all the righteousness of Christ, His righteous life, as righteous as He is when He rose from the dead, all that is in the bank account for you. All that can be your righteousness. All that you you have access to be just as righteous and holy and living just as holy and righteous as He is when He rose from the dead. Thodius was another figure in the early church. He was actually a Christian martyr who lived in the end of the third century. He wrote repeatedly on the topic of free will. Methodius said, Those pagans who decide that man does not have free will, but say that he is governed by the unavoidable necessities of fate, are guilty of impiety toward God himself, Amen. making him out to be the cause and author of human evils. Sounds like he he's describing Calvinism to a T. The Calvinist God is bipolar, shedding his crocodile tears when men go to hell. When God made them behave in such a way as to go there in the first freaking place. Look, how can you go? How can how can you not call such a God a, a monster worse than Freddy Krueger? When he could elect everybody to be saved according to Calvinism, but chooses not to do so, just so he can show off how bad his dark side of wrath is to the redeemed. The Bible says, "Who will have, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth?" I believe. I believe God truly wishes that everybody could be saved. But this is impossible when God gives, sovereignly gives free will to his creatures. He God says God has the determined the, the parameters by which, which you must follow if you are to believe in him by faith and be saved. And 
it is impossible with free will, impossible for everybody to be saved. Methodius said, the divine being is not by nature implicated in evils. Therefore, our birth is not the cause of these things. He went on to say that men are possessing free will and not by nature evil. Methodius I would say we got the stain of sin in us. And that makes us the law, the law of sin and death, as Paul says. The law of sin and death is inside every one of us, inherited by Adam. We can choose to do, do good or evil, but like I said, you must be accept the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans. Thodius said, There is nothing evil by nature, but it is by use that evil things become such. So I say, says he, that man was made with free will, not as if there were already evil in existence, which he had the power of choosing if he wished, but on account of his capacity of obeying or disobeying God. For this was the meaning of the gift of free will, and this alone is evil, namely disobedience. Methodius said, God did not make evil, nor is he at all in any way the author of evil. But Are you listening, Calvinism? Are you listening, Dr. John MacArthur? Whatever failed to keep the law, which he in all justice ordained, after being made by him with a faculty of free will, for the purpose of guarding and keeping it, is called evil. Now it is the gravest fault to disobey God by overstepping the bounds of that righteousness which is consistent with free will. Eusebius was a bishop in the early church. He's actually considered the father of church history for his extensive writing on the topics. Eusebius clearly laid out the position of early Christianity on the topic of free will. The creator of all things has impressed a natural law upon the soul of every man as an assistant and ally in his conduct, pointing out to him the right way by this law, but by the free liberty with which he is endowed, making the choice of what is best worthy of praise and acceptance, because he has acted rightly, not by force, but from his own free will, when he had it in his power to act otherwise, as again, making him who chooses what is worst, deserving of blame and punishment, as having by his own motion neglected the natural law and becoming the... Okay, 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 okay. Let me answer an objection given by uh, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon says he could not believe in the God of Armenianism that would let one precious saint of his fall from grace and go to hell. And Calvin and John Wesley struggled with double election, double predestination. Those who would be predestined to be saved and lose it. They, they believe like we're like robots. God predestines, controls everything, even our choices. And they could not understand why God would choose some to be saved and then turn around and turn around and lose that, give up, uh, abandon their salvation and die and go to hell. That is so freaking simple. If we, if we so freaking simple, if we got the right theology, morons. I'm angry. Those who are sinners have free will to choose. To live in sin, ignore, turn a deaf ear to God, or to seek God, and when the God Spirit speaks to this Spirit, enables them to respond in faith, they have, they can choose to do so. And when they do so, they pass from death into life, and are given a new nature, and can see the kingdom of God, which is righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost, because they've been born again. Those who have already been saved born again, had the choice to continue, endure to the end, or whether through stepping, lapsing into the sin or denying Jesus Christ. Remember, he that denies not, not me, why I deny for my Father and his angels in heaven. The born, it ain't over. It, life is a test. 
Just because God loves you as a child of his does not mean he takes away your free will and that you not perish spiritually and die and go to hell. You understand? You understand me? The test is uh, the test is not over until you cross the River Jordan, until you die. You must endure the end. The early church father's salvation sal salvation in two phases. When you first got saved and when you died in the faith. If you do not die in the faith, if you do not die in the faith, guess where you go? You you will go to hell in the lake of fire forever and ever. You got to get, endure until the end. You understand? Jeez, leave it to a theologian to make something so simple, so fucking complicated. Stupid Calvinists. The or Calvinists piss me off. Origin and fountain of wickedness, and misusing himself, not from any extraneous necessity, but from free will and judgment. The fault is in him who chooses not in God, for God is has not made nature or the substance of the soul bad. For he who is good can make nothing but what is good. Everything is good which is according to nature. Every rational soul has naturally a good free will formed for the choice of what is good. But when a man acts wrongly, nature is not to be blamed. For what is wrong takes place not according to nature, but contrary to nature, it being the... On the surface, it sounds like you can just pull yourself up by bootstraps. And start doing good and die and go to heaven. Nah, nah, nah. It's not that simple. You, you are stained with sin. And sin cannot enter into the presence of God. Sin will burn up. Your sin question. The, your, your ability to sin. Inherited from Adam. Must be crucified through the death of Christ on that cross. And then you can obey. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. He must choose to put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what, that's what you, that's, what, that's the good you can do. Choose to put on the Lord Jesus Christ his death and shed blood as your and, and resurrection is your death and resurrection to do good. That's your choice now. Something we sometimes I want to kill myself for how I look. The work of choice and not of nature. The devil in his oracles hangs all things upon fate and taking away that which is in our power and arises from self motion of free will brings this also into bondage to necessity. The early church, before Augustine, taught that free will was a faculty of our God-given nature, and that we abuse that faculty when we choose to sin. They said that all men are of the same nature, in the sense that free will was in the faculties of all men. Irenaeus said, For as much as all men are of the same nature, having power to hold and to do that which is good, and having power again to lose it, and not to do what is right before men of sins, and how much more before God. Some are justly accused, and receive condign punishment, because they refuse what is just and right. Irenaeus said, Those who do not do it, good, will receive the just judgment of God, because they had not worked good when they had it in their power to do so. But if some had been made by nature bad, and others good, these latter would not be deserving of praise for being good, for they were created that way. Nor would the former be reprehensible, for that is how they were made. You had the new birth in you which cannot sin, and you had the sin, stain of sin which cannot do good. Good being defined as that you do the, your act of goodness come from God and going to God. So the, the believer who is born again has a choice. Let the stain of sin rule in his life, on his ruin, or let his new birth rule in his life to glory. However, all men are of the same nature. They are all able to hold fast and do what is good. On the other hand, they have the power to cast good from them and not to do it. Pelagius said, 
In all, there is free will, equally by nature. Oregon said, The scriptures emphasize the freedom of will. They condemn those who sin and approve those who do right. We are responsible for being bad and worthy of being cast outside. For it is not the nature in us that is the cause of the evil. Rather, it is the voluntary choice that works evil. Hmm. But Paul the Apostle seems to disagree with... They may, These people are making it like... I don't know. Did, did these men read the Apostle Paul? For that in me, my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And except a man be born from above, he cannot sing the kingdom of God. Or did this? Did these mean men swing to the other stream of Calvinism? Oregon said, "The heretics, the Gnostics, introduced the doctrine of different natures." There are two conflicting views of human nature in the days of the early church. The early Christians believed that free will was in the nature of all men. Some men used that freedom to be good, some men used that freedom to be evil, but they viewed that the moral character of man was altogether voluntary. The Gnostics, on the other hand, believed that mankind had such ruined and corrupt natures that they were not free to choose between good and evil. They viewed the actions and behaviors of men as being necessitated and caused by their natures. And therefore, they viewed the moral character of man as to be sort of involuntary, not truly their fault, but a, a fault in their design. The early Christians taught that it's not that men are good or evil by nature, that good men have a nature that forces them to do good, that evil men have evil natures that force them to do evil, but that all men have the same nature and all men have free will. Some men use that free will to be good. Some men use that free will to be evil. Anyone who actually takes the time to study the writings of the early church and is willing to look beyond Augustine will see that... I, sh I assure you, Paul Washer, if you'd read old books, you'd find that this is so. It's your theology, your Calvinist theology is not correct. It's more... I don't know. that free will was the universal and orthodox position of all of the early Christians. I know one, if he's comparing, if he's saying about, what he's saying about the Gnostics sounds so, so much like Calvinism, but I know, I know the Gnostics and Calvinism are not in the same get, camp, I know that, but I would explain why John Calvin was a fucking murderer. I hope John Calvin in contempt. If God did not call John Calvin the task for his evil deeds, then God is not a just God. Then screw him. Anyone who takes the time to study the early church and will actually look beyond Augustine will see that free will was universally the orthodox Christian doctrine. For example, John Calvin, who didn't hold to the doctrine of free will, admitted this fact. John Calvin said this, As to the fathers, if their authority weighs with us, they have the term free will constantly in their mouths. He also said, The Greek fathers above others have taught the power of the human will, and they have not been ashamed to make use of a much more arrogant expression, calling man free agent or self-manager. John Dear John Calvin, you son of a bitch, they were closer to the time of Christ than you were. So I'm going to believe them before I w w will believe you, you murdering son of a bitch. Just as if man had the power to govern himself. But what they, what they came up short is, you know, you, worked, you must be, uh, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Because we got the stain of sin in our nature. I guess what they, all, all church, early church fathers are saying is, Nobody is predestined to do, nobody is made in such a way that they can only do evil or only do righteousness. Everybody has a free choice. They did not elaborate on the technical 
technicals of being born again, of being in Adam, or being in Christ. But geez, sometimes the more I read uh, what the early church fathers believed and said, some sometimes it makes me, makes me doubt if Jesus is real. Calvin also recognized that the Latin fathers have always retained the word free will as if man yet stood upright. Episcopius said, What is plainer than that the ancient divines, for 300 years after Christ, those at least who flourished before St. Augustine, maintained the liberty of our will, or an indifference of two contrary things, free from all internal and external necessity. Walter Arthur Coppinger said, all the fathers are unanimous on the freedom of the human will. Lyman Beecher said, The free will and natural ability of man were held by the whole church. Dr. Wigger said, All the fathers agreed with the Pelagians in attributing freedom of will to man in his present state. This last quote is extremely important, because today, whenever a person believes in free will, or that man has the natural ability to obey God or not, He's almost immediately accused by Calvinists of being a heretical. Now I was almost brainwashed by those Calvinists. Pelagian, but this accusation is truly being unfair to the free will position, because all of the early church before Augustine believed that man had a free will, and this was before Pelagius even existed. The Pelagians believed in the doctrine of free will, but that doesn't mean everyone who believes in the doctrine of free will is a Pelagian. In fact, such reasoning is truly fallacious. Amen. For example. The Catholics believe in the virgin birth, but that doesn't mean everyone who believes in the virgin birth is a Catholic. Amen. Because the virgin birth is not exclusively a Catholic doctrine. Likewise, free will is not exclusively a, a Pelagian doctrine. Therefore, not everyone who believes in free will is a Pelagian. Williston Walker said that even in Pelagius' own day, Pelagius' teaching on the freedom of the human will was in agreement with many in the West and with the East generally. Asa Mahan said, Free will was the doctrine of the primitive church for the first four or five centuries after the Bible was written. The church which received the lively oracles directly from the hands of some of those whom they were written to wit, the writers of the New Testament. It should be borne in mind here that at the time the sacred canon was completed, the doctrine of necessity was held by the leading sects in the Jewish church. It was also the fundamental article of the creed of all the sects in philosophy throughout the world, as well as of all the forms of heathenism than extant. If the doctrine of necessity, as its advocates maintain, is the doctrine taught the church by inspired apostles and the writers of the New Testament, we should not fail to find under such circumstances the churches planted by them, rooted and grounded in this doctrine. David Burso said, the early Christians didn't believe that man is totally depraved and incapable of doing any good. They taught that humans are capable of obeying and loving God. There was a religious group labeled as heretics by the early Christians. They taught that man is totally depraved. The group I'm referring to are the Gnostics. Okay, okay, okay. David, in the Psalms it says... How should, where, where, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed there unto, unto thy word? The word of God. The word of God has a power. That power is the Holy Spirit. When the people in the Old Testament or the people today hear the word of God, and they, they, it's the Holy Spirit that works something into them. They, they want to do good. It, what the Holy Spirit is trying to do is to lead you to a place where you realize you can you you are to, you you are totally helpless without God, and once you pass once you listen to the Holy Spirit and listen to the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit tells you when you hear the message of the cross of Christ, you, this is what you need. This is what you need. You are broken. You got because you got the stain of sin that's broken you. You you are incomplete without me. Then once you respond to that, I lost my train of thought. Then that that's what you should, you should supposed to do. But believing in the word of God, 
when you hear the word of God and you want to do good, that's because the Holy Spirit's working in you. Yeah, Calvinism says you must be born again to be able to exercise faith in Jesus Christ. They're getting it backwards. What they're confusing, they're confusing being born again with enlightened by the Spirit. When you hear the Word of God, the Spirit enlightens you, creating in you a desire to do good, a desire to come to God. That's not passing, that's yet you have not passed from life unto death until you, by faith, say, Yes, come to my life, Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive my sins by Jesus' death and shed the blood of that cross. And you really mean it from your heart. You say that from your heart. You know, it's not, you say, you can't just say a little prayer, say the name of Jesus, and you instant salvation in the can. It's got to come from the heart. If it doesn't come from the heart, it's not going to do you a damn bit of good. When reading the writings of the early church, you would think by these... Man, if I hadn't had a stroke, I'm sorry if my thinking and my comments are so freaking disjointed. Don't blame me on my, I mean, blame me on this damn stroke I had. And there's a power, I'm doubting. They've proven that there is no exodus. The, the stories of Adam and Eve were based upon earlier myths and legends. But I choose to believe those stories because there's a power. I believe in Jesus. I gotta believe in Jesus. But still, there's the doubt. Jesus, are you really real? All these stories are about in the Bible. Moses, Exodus, Adam and Eve. Are, are those historically true or are they allegories? Jesus, are you even real? But when I believe in Jesus, I feel a sense of completeness, a light. If I don't believe in Jesus... Life is tense, unhappy, even if I do fulfill my dream to be the good looking guy. I need Jesus. Now, Jesus, are you real or is this, some, is this, is this some cosmic glitch? If Jesus is not real, then Christianity is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated upon mankind, a cosmic cruelty. If Jesus Christ is not real, in Christianity, there can, there will never, ever, ever, as long as eternity lasts, be created a hoax, so great a hoax upon humanity. If Christianity and Jesus, true Christianity, if Jesus is not real, then it is the greatest hoax perpetrated upon mankind. These quotes, they were debating Calvinists and that they were refuting Calvinism. But it was actually the Gnostics that they were coming against. It was Gnosticism that they were refuting. It should cause no small stir to those who hold to the inability of man, that they can't find any support for their doctrine from the early church, but they only have the Gnostics who agree with them. The what about the Apostle Paul? For I, know that in, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. Well, if no good thing, no good thing, no good thing. Only once you are enlightened by the Spirit can you... Went to by reading God's word. When you're enlightened by the Spirit of God, and if you, and if you see nature, and know that there somewhere out there there is a God, as it says in Romans, those who have not heard the message of the gospel, they are without excuse, because they look out and they know there's a God, and they want to know this God. And they seek this God, even though they're doing it with their stained sinful nature. God honors that. And I believe there are some heathen and some Catholics, maybe some Muslims, all I knew. But all, Jesus said, to whom so little, little is given, little is required. They, to the best of uh, understanding, saw after the face of God. And God will not disappoint them. And God will save them through the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus is the only way. Yes. But Jesus said, to whom little is given, little is required. 
The errors of the Gnostics were continually rejected by the early church, but the Gnostics continued to try to infiltrate the church. But he also says, how, th how, say they, how say, shall they believe on him in whom they not, have not heard? Jesus, what is the truth? Their doctrine. The Gnostics even wrote their own Gospels, known as the Gnostic Gospels, where they stole credible names like Mary or Thomas to try and give validity to their teachings. And while the church today seems to reject Gnosticism as a whole, the Gnostic view of human nature and the Gnostic view of sin seems to have found wide acceptance today, while the view of the early church is seldom held to or taught. Next, we're going to look at how the early church ended up departing from its earlier views. That's one thing that makes me ask Jesus if you're really real. These men desired only to serve you. They desired to further your kingdom. Why, why is it then that these same men, led by your spirit, have created so much division within your kingdom? Lord Jesus Christ, if you're really real, why? Why? Why is it not a blissful consistency amongst your servants as what is truth? And remember, no lie is of the truth. If it's not true, it's a lie. Christians believed in free will, what went wrong? When did this change and who changed it? If the church was perfectly united for hundreds of years on this point, if the Spirit of God is leading all these Christians, why then are there, there are divisions? Who caused this division? These are very important questions that screw you, God, for this. Screw you. Few seem to consider, yet the answer in history is obvious enough. It was not until the 4th century that Gnostic and Manichaean doctrine began to influence the church. Augustine, after saturating himself in Gnostic philosophy for nearly a decade, was converted to the church and as he was appointed as a bishop. Augustine, once he was in the church, began to contradict what the fathers had always taught about free will, and he taught views that were in accordance with the Gnostic doctrines. And it was under Augustine's influence that the church began to embrace the doctrine of the natural inability of man. Now, it is an undisputed and known fact of history that Augustine was influenced by Gnosticism and was a member of Manichaeanism. But the scripture, if you read the, those simple scriptures, they, they seem to strongly infer Except man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And 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 Romans Paul fourteen Romans fourteen Paul writes for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, "There is none good but God." Jesus told the rich young ruler, "There is none good but God. No one is good but God. No one is good but God." Oh, some would argue that, but Apostle Paul also says there's none that does good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. So if, if you can, if you can just by simple free will choice, oh, I'm going to start doing good today. I'm going to start living righteous today. If you can start doing that and go to heaven by that alone. Why does Paul say, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. None, none, none. You, you understand what the word none means? For all have sinned and fall, come short of the glory of God. For there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In fact, this is a point admitted by his biographers and admirers. John K. Ryan, in his introduction to The Confessions of St. Augustine, said, The two great intellectual influences upon Augustine prior to his conversion were Manichaeism and Greek philosophy. In their introduction to The Confessions of Augustine, John Gibb and William Montgomery said, 
In the same year in which he read the scriptures and was disappointed in them, Augustine joined the Manichaean sect. For nearly nine years, Augustine was a Manichaean auditor. At first, he was a zealous partisan who contended publicly for his new faith and did not hesitate to ridicule the doctrines of the church and especially the Old Testament scriptures. The founder of Manichaeanism was Manes, also known as Manny, whom we saw Archelius of the early church debated against. Augustine was a Manichaean for many years, and he personally studied the writings of Manny. Surprisingly, when Augustine first converted to the church... I know it's my experience. You cannot do good for Jesus' sake, for the flesh... But yeah, Paul, Paul the Apostle says, for the flat, uh, and uh, the fruit these people say, you can just do, 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 do good or evil. Paul says, for the flesh, let me, let me get my Bible and read this to you. Since I can't remember, I can't remember how it goes. For the, okay. Okay, let me find, find Romans. Damn, I'm wasting so much damn time. Sometimes I want to kill myself. I hate God for how I look. Not looking good. I hate God for not making me a good looking guy. I love God, but I hate him for how... I hate him for my physical betterness. Not being an alpha male. Not being a good looking guy. I hate God for making me not good looking. I hate him. I love him, but I hate him for that. Okay. Let's see. For they that are for they that are, for they that are in the flesh cannot please God. For they that are not in the, the shit. For they that are in the flesh cannot please God. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. For to be spiritually minded is a life and joy and peace, but to be carnally minded is death. So it sounds to me from scripture like there are two natures. One, the new birth, which nature you must have if you are to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. And the other nature, which is bent towards sin and cannot be, we cannot be bent towards God because it's the stain of sin makes you worship, want to, Make make you want to make yourself your own god, and in my opposition, and you cannot submit, you cannot make God your god because you only you're your own god. You're powerless to change that because it's your nature. You must be born of God, be able to die to self, and through the cross of Jesus Christ. You die with Jesus of Christ on that cross. You die to your self. You die to your your de de desire to make yourself God dies on, with Jesus Christ on that cross vicariously, and and the shed blood pays for the your sins. You turn over uh, Jesus Christ was turned over to the devil, and. Died for us when he never sinned a day of his life. And rose from the grave. Because he was also God. So he was turned over. Had he been just a man. When he would, would have been turned over to the devil. He would have been powerless to overcome the devil. But because he was God. He was able to overcome the devil. Raise himself up for the dead. And through his resurrection. Vicariously he re we die to ourselves and uh, uh, come uh, vicariously rose from the dead in Jesus Christ to live under God. For 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 the Bible says for he died in the sin once, but in the, in that he liveth, he liveth under God. 
So then they that are in the flesh can so then they that are in, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I believe that means consistently. You can do things that are pleasing to God, but you cannot please God perfectly. Because unless you got the new birth. Sure it pleases God when you seek him and want to do good and want to do righteous, but that that that's not Gonna get you into heaven. He began to defend free will when debating against the Manichaeans. That's why quotes from Augustine can be found from his earlier writings in which he defended the freedom of man's will. Augustine said, We Christians assert the liberty of the will, whereby our actions are rendered either moral or immoral, and keep it free from every bond of necessity, on account of the righteous judgment of God. After refuting the Manichaeans and defending free will, when Augustine was debating the Pelagians on theological issues, he went back to the doctrine of the natural inability of man, just as the Manichaeans had taught, and just as he had formerly believed as a Gnostic. Augustine said, I have tried hard to maintain the free choice of the human will, but the grace of God prevailed. Bosob said, Augustine... Okay, if he says the Spirit of God led him to stop believing in the free will of man, Jesus, are you real? Why, is, why are you not leading every Christian to the same conclusion if you are the truth? Augustine defended free will so long as he had to do with the Manichaeans. But when he came to dispute with the Pelagians, he changed his system. Then he denied that kind of freedom which before he had defended. And so far as I am able to judge, his sentiments no longer differed from theirs. The Manichaeans concerning the servitude of the will. He ascribed the servitude to the corruption which original sin brought into our nature, whereas the Manichaeans ascribed it to an evil quality eternally inherent in matter. Charles Finney said, This doctrine is a stumbling block both to the church and the world, infinitely dishonorable to God, and an abomination alike to God and the human intellect, and should be banished from every pulpit and from every formula of doctrine and from the world. It is a relic of heathen philosophy and was foisted in among the doctrines of Christianity by Augustine, as everyone may know who will take the trouble to examine for... Okay, here's my conclusion. People have different... People are viewing the truth from different angles. This causes so many different doctrines. People, uh, whether it's Augustine or... Calvinists or Armenians they're hitting they're hitting at the truth from, from, from their false human thinking they're preaching the truth they're looking at this like a they see the truth like they're reflecting in a dark glass you can't see yourself as you true you are it's colored by Misperceptions. There, there. Fuck it, man. I, can, I, I wish I had the words to explain what I'm trying to fucking say. I can see it clearly in my mind, but I cannot find the fucking words to, to, to lay it down so you can understand what I'm thinking. That. Sometimes I want to fucking kill myself. Himself. I am so alone. Harry Kahn said that Augustine. After studying the philosophy of Manes, the Persian philosopher, brought into the church from Manichaeism the doctrine of original sin. It seems to me that Paul the Apostle taught that in Adam all are made sinners. I thought that's where the doctrine of original sin came from. But David Bashaw says that it's a stain of sin. And when Adam sinned, we all, we always we 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 inherited the stain of sin. Sin. The corruption of our nature, or the loss of our free will, Augustine credited to the original sin of Adam. Here's a, here here's how it works. You can do good of evil, but because you got the stain of sin, it's gonna drag you down. The law it's called the law of sin and death. 
The stain of sin is going to drag you down to commit sin. And sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Augustine said, free choice of the will was present in that man who was the first to be formed. But after he sinned by that free will, we who have descended from his progeny have been plunged into necessity. Oh, shit. Augustine said, by Adam's transgression, the freedom of the human will has been completely lost. Oh, shit. Augustine said, by the greatness of the first sin, we have lost the free will to love God. But there's some truth to that. For they that are, for they that are in the flesh cannot please God, Paul the Apostle said. For the for the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Augustine said, by subverting the rectitude in which he was created, he is followed with a that is is that those tidbits of truth is why maybe he thought God was. Uh, the grace of God was leading him away from believing in free will because for him to believe, be able to believe in free will, he would have to deny what tidbit of truth he knew because he was seen through the glass darkly. With the punishment of not being able to do right, Augustine said, the freedom to abstain from sin has been lost as a punishment of sin. A simple reading of Genesis, specifically the narrative of the original sin of Adam, reveals that the Bible nowhere states that free will was lost because of his sin. In fact, in all of the consequences that God declared because of their sin, the loss of their free will, or that of their descendants, <coughs> is not mentioned or even hinted at. Rather, after the fall of Adam and Eve, God continued to speak to men as if they were free moral agents with the power of self-determination. For example, in Genesis, we read God speaking to Cain as a free moral agent. We read this, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. There are many other scriptures in which God speaks to men after the fall of Adam as free moral agents possessing the power of self-determination. How much longer is this day? Behold, video? I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But the Paul says, for the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So, these laws were given to show us that we cannot, we had that sin stain, that something that's terribly flawed within us, that we cannot continue to keep the law of God without sinning, without fall, turning away from God, so that this is meant to lead you to, to the knowledge that you need Jesus Christ, you need to be forgiven of your sins by his death and shed blood, and you need to be born again so that you can enter, enter the kingdom of God and keep the command the commandments of God. Now I, that that's right that's what I believe in. That's that that's the way it is. Deuteronomy chapter eleven verses twenty six to twenty eight. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua chapter twenty four verse fifteen. Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Jeremiah chapter 21 verse 8. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die? Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 30 to 31. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. In light of scriptures like these, many students of the Bible have recognized the fact that free will or the power of self-determination actually survived Adam's misuse. For the law, for the carnal man is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
Adam Clark commented on Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verse 26, and said, If God had not put it in the power of this people, either to obey or disobey, if they had not had a free will over which they had complete authority. But God's goal was to get you not to keep the commandments because God's, God's goal was not to get you to keep the commandments for keeping the commandments sakes, but to know him personally. And in knowing him, you would obey him from the heart. That's the way you were regenerated in the Old Testament. That This is probably the reason why Calvinism confuses, confusingly says you must be born again before you can have faith in Jesus Christ. To use it either in the way of willing or nilling, could God, with any propriety, have given such precepts as these, sanctioned with such promises and threatenings? If they were not free agents, they could not be punished for disobedience, nor could they, in any sense of the word, have been rewardable for obedience. Have you ever noticed how David, he broke, he, he, he broke God's command in Deuteronomy 17, 17, which says that the king shall not multiply to himself wives. David broke that command. But yet, David was called a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David had a love for God that made him want to keep God's commands, even if he didn't do it perfectly. God had rather have somebody who wants to obey a loving and breaks a few of his commandments than somebody who keeps all the commandments of the law perfectly, but doesn't do it because he loves God, but does it for him because of himself. Irenaeus said, God has always preserved freedom and the power of self-government in man. Man is possessed of free will from the beginning. Oregon said, the faculty of free will is never taken away. Even after salvation. Cornelius Van Til said, Sin did not take away from man any of the natural powers that God had given him. Dr. Twist said, No faculty of our nature is taken away from us by original sin. Pelagius said, We have first of all to discuss the position which is maintained that our nature has been weakened and changed by sin. I think that before all other things, we have to inquire what sin is. Some substance, or wholly a name without substance, whereby is expressed not a thing, not an existence, not some sort of a body, but the doing of a wrongful deed. I suppose that this is the case, and if so, how could that which lacks all substance have possibly weakened or changed human nature? No will can take away that which is proved to be inseparably implanted in nature. Julian of Eclanum said, Free will is an all by nature, and could not perish by the sin of Adam, which assertion is confirmed by the authority of all scriptures. Julian of Eclanum said, Free will has not perished, since the Lord says by the prophets, If you be willing and will hear me, you shall eat the good things of the land. If you are unwilling and will not hear, the sword shall devour you. If Augustine did not learn... Even though I'm doubting, seriously doubting, the historicity of Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, that word of God has a power to it that makes me want to preach it as, as, uh, preach it like it is true. Because believing in the word of God just makes me happy. And fulfilled in, in, in a way that this better than the, uh, the Mormons do for believing in Joseph Smith. The joy that the Mormons believe get from believing in Joseph Smith and that the Hindus get from believing in their Hindu gods is not as complete, whole, wholesome, and satisfying as the joy I get from, you know, believing in Jesus. So Jesus has to be real for that reason. He has to be real. Jesus, but I'm wondering, Jesus, are you really real? Learn from the scriptures that free will was lost as a result of Adam's sin. Where did his novel know? Yes, believing, believing, the Indians belief in their gods 
the Hindus and their gods, the Mormons and their gods, and the Islam, Islam and their gods provides a satisfaction and happiness. But it's, it's not the same as the happiness and satisfaction I feel believing in Jesus. Notion come from. Understanding Augustine's background as a Manichaean, it's easy to understand how Augustine believed man had a ruined and corrupted nature without the freedom to choose between good and evil. There were a total of 19 bishops within the church, including Julian of Aclanum, who opposed Augustine. You can choose to follow your sinful nature deeper and deeper into sin until you have no desire whatsoever to your totally hardened past feeling had no desire for good whatsoever just totally evil or you can choose to seek God until he uh, you find him and you pass from death into life by the new birth by the Holy Spirit coming to live in your spirit which he does when he forgives your sins by the death and shed blood of Jesus Christ on that cross the spirit and the cross work hand in hand. No forgiveness of sin, no new birth. Augustine's teaching that free will had been lost. The Holy Spirit reveals himself to you by hearing the word of God. These bishops must have thought to themselves, Who is this Bishop Augustine that denied? And if you had not heard the word of God, when you see Nate, if he never heard of Jesus Christ, you look at Nate and know something's out there. Oh, that's how, okay, okay, I, I asked a question earlier in the video. How shall they believe on him and whom they have not heard? Okay, the heathen in the jungle. They have heard, they have heard, they can believe on Jesus and not know the name of Jesus. When they hear the message of nature, when they when through nature, they through the stars in the sky, which testify of the glory of God, they know there must be something out there. And they, and if they, with that what little lot they have, feel the desire and need for whatever's out there. God will supply the rest to, the, to them. God will give them the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And lead them to Jesus Christ. Denies free will. The early church fathers always held to the freedom of man's nature. Oh, Augustine used to be a Gnostic? He was a Manichaean? Well, that explains it. Julian of Eclanum stated Augustine's position. By the sin of the first man, that is, of Adam, free will perished. And that no one has now the power of living well but that all are constrained into sin yes. by the necessity of their flesh. Yes. Yes. Reverend Daniel R. Jennings said, Julian sends to carry over of Manichaean thought from Augustine yes. into the yes. Christian necessity of their flesh, power of living well, but that all free will picks position. By the sin of the first man, that is, of Adam, free will perished, and that no one has now the power of living well, but that all are constrained into sin by the necessity of their flesh. Reverend Daniel R. Jennings said, Jul Yeah, there's true, much truth to that statement, but it's also true you have a, the God-shaped void. Something inside of man cries out for God. And if you seek God, you will find him and pass from life into death once you find him. Julian. Man, this stuff is so simple. And these fucking morons just... You get their act together. Julian sends to carry over of Manichaean thought from Augustine into the Christian church. This is why I'm Julian angry. referred to the Augustinians as those Manichaeans. I'm angry. George you Prediman said. And you, says, you, just, you hear my content for the ignorance of these people. Dean was in the early part of his life a Manichaean, but some remains of it seem to have been still left upon his mind. By teaching that man did not possess free will, and that sin was therefore a result of a defect within what? man's fools. nature, oh, Augustine fools. was actually bringing into the church Gnostic concepts. Maybe Satan has done a good job of blinding even the elect believers to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. ...and doctrines. Sin was no longer viewed as a, as a purely ethical problem, 
or a problem of how man uses his faculty of will, but sin became a problem of metaphysics, a, a fault in the faculty of the will itself. Those laymen and bishops who stood up against Augustine's view that free will had been lost, who accused Augustine of teaching Manichaeanism, who continued to teach the old truths of Christianity, what the early church had always taught, were condemned as heretics and labeled as Pelagians once Augustinian theology had dominance. Those many bishops who taught that free will was not lost by the original sin of Adam, and who continued to teach that men were sinful not by constitution, but by choice, were ripped out of their pulpits, had their material possessions confiscated, and were excommunicated by both state and church. That's what you get. Cal Calvinism. John Calvin. That's what you get when you try, try to mix the kingdoms of the world with the kingdom of light. These dark deeds of the flesh committed by servants of God. The doctrine of the early church, or the doctrine of free will, was soon replaced with the Gnostic concept of a necessitated will because of a ruined, corrupted, sinful nature. I highly recommend that you watch this video right here. In fact, so highly I recommend it, I'm going to put it in the link in the description. Augustinian theology was a radical departure from the views of the early church. And like Calvinism after it, Augustinianism used governmental force to silence any opposition so that its views could spread without challenge. There are subtle differences and yet major similarities between Augustinianism and full-blown Gnosticism. And if God did not judge Augustine and Calvin for their evil deeds, he is not a just God. Uh, if God if God did not just Augustine and Calvin for that evil murders and evil deeds, then fuck you, God, and fuck you, unjust judge, if you don't get a judgment. I say that from my heart. Are you a just God or not? How can you turn a blind eye just because their service is yours? Oh. I guess so. I guess God can turn a blind eye because Jesus Christ paid for those sins on that cross. And if God wants to be merciful for these Christians who committed such reprehensible acts, that's his choice, and God can do so and still be just. Gnosticism. The Gnostics, for example, taught that man's nature was ruined and corrupt because man was created by an inferior god known as the Demiurge. Augustine, on the other hand, agreed with the Gnostics that man's nature was so corrupt that we didn't have a free will, yet he said God made it this way on account of Adam's sin. And the Gnostics taught that the flesh was sinful in and of itself, therefore Jesus Christ did not have a flesh. Augustine, on the other hand, taught that the flesh, because of its desires, was sinful, and that this sin is transmitted from parent to child through the sexual passions of intercourse, yet Jesus, because he was born of a virgin, was born without this hereditary sin. Therefore, Augustine agreed with the Gnostics in principle, but he differed from them in explanation. So Augustinian theology is really a uh, modified Manichaeanism or a semi-Gnosticism. Let's consider the following facts. All of the early Christians before Augustine believed in man's free will and denied the doctrine of natural inability. The Gnostics in the days of the early church believed in man's natural inability and denied the doctrine of free will. Augustine was a Gnostic for nearly a decade. Here's one thing about Gnostics that you're not seeing. The, because the, Gnostics, the, the Gnostics believed on the, the spiritual side was only capable of doing good. And that because their flesh was only capable capable of doing evil, they might as well indulge in the flesh. Because if they gained access to the secret knowledge, they would be saved. So that it was just an excuse to be able to sin, live in sin, live like the devil. Because they believed their salvation would come from that hidden knowledge, Gnosis. 
So you, do y'all understand? Do y'all really completely understand what the fuck the Gnostics, Gnostics were about? They were nothing. The Calvinists are godly saints compared to those filthy, sinful Gnostics. Those Gnostics were despicable sinners. In the Manichaean sect, and he converted to the church out of Gnosticism. After joining the church and being appointed a bishop, Augustine began to deny the doctrine of free will and to teach the natural inability of man. And the church, under Augustine's influence, began to believe in the doctrine of natural inability, which it never before held to, and which, prior to Augustine, they would argue against. Man proposes, but God often disposes. God is in charge of history. Why is he using Augustine's lie? To shape his church like he did. Why? Why is not God's spirit not? Why, why, why is God doing that? What can we conclude from these facts except that when Augustine converted to the church out of Gnosticism, he brought with him some Gnostic doctrines. His views regarding human nature and free will was not held at all by the early Christians, but was held by the Gnostics. Clearly, Augustine departed from the views of the early Christians and remained in agreement with Gnosticism. Augustinian theology has tainted Christian doctrine so that we have been influenced by Gnostic views. The church seems... Which maybe asks, if Calvinists... I, I truly believe Calvinism. I truly felt my spirit being led towards Calvinism when I first heard it. Did I learn by the early church fathers... Is it the Spirit of God leading this, is it, or is it our own beliefs? Jesus, are you really real? Are you really real? Are you really real? Or are you the greatest hoax perpetrated upon mankind? It seems to have gone wrong at the time of Augustine, I'm and that church history after Fuck him you, has God. been affected. So next, we're going to look at how other influential church leaders have been influenced by Augustine's I believe teachings in you. and continue to I'm propagate those ideas. Does not encourage me. I'm having to ha I'm I'm having to hang on, force myself. I'm having to hang on for dear life to keep on believing you. Compelled. Is it is it, is in the compulsion to believe in you? Is that is this you, or is this my fear that if I don't believe in you, I'm in deep shit. Are you real, Jesus? On August 9th, 1173, construction began on a Is tower that Bible in Italy. Historically true? By the time the construction progressed to the third All floor, the tower began somewhere. to lean. The problem was that the foundation underneath the structure was not solid. And because the foundation was not solid, the entire structure was affected. The builders continued to build upon this faulty foundation. And that's why this tower has been forever branded as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. In church history, Christian theology began to lean off course around the time of the 5th century. Augustinian doctrine became foundational in theology. The conclusions that Augustine came to became the premises of theologians after him. And building upon that foundation, the direction of church history has been forever affected. Augustine actually taught many false doctrines, such Until as... Until we had murderers like John Calvin. But because John Calvin loved God and loved Jesus, and was born again, all those murderers, all those heretics he killed, God's just going to turn a blind eye to it. Such as praying to the dead or persecuting heretics. Uh, infant damnation, the transmission of sin, uh, infant baptism, a baptismal regeneration. And while Augustine's views were not adopted by all the groups within Christendom, such as the Anabaptist or the Eastern Orthodox churches, it was Augustine's view. Here's one thing that really, okay, here's, okay. Jesus, here's one thing that really causes me to stumble and offends me and makes me angry at you. Screw you for this. 
Okay. Is not your blood and death alone good enough to forgive our sins? And you res your the power your death shed blood and resurrection. Is not why then did believers as early as Augustine, maybe before, preach that is if infants were not baptized, their sins were not washed away. Why why were they were they actually that stupid, ignorant of your blood and death, of the teachings of the Apostle Paul? How could that be so stupid, unforgivably stupid, unforgivably, unforgivably ignorant of the fact that you could forgive a person's sins strictly by your, it's your death and shed blood that forgives us of our sins? Why, why did they think that infants went to limbo if they were not baptized because they were not forgiven of the sins? When your death and shed blood paid the price for the forgiveness of our sins. Unless the only church... No, that's what the scripture, that's what the scripture teaches. Jesus, you got some stupid children. I'll say that to you. God, you got some stupid children. You, you're not the author of confusion, but your children sure are. And I hold many of them in contempt and anger. I'm so angry when so much is at stake for all this confusion. Screw you, God. The view regarding human nature and free will I'm that angry. went beyond the Catholic Church into the Protestant realm. The greatest contributors to modern theology have been Augustine, Luther. If we, if we, okay, people like. Those, those of you who say you've got to, if you got if you don't get baptized, you're not saved, turn with me in this Bible to the book of Acts. This is the story of Cornelius. Peter is preaching the word to them while Peter yet spake Acts chapter 10 verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word, and they all of circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles were poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify, magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? That these should not be baptized, which have already received the Holy Ghost, as well as we, I added that word already. So, these men, Gentiles, received the Holy Spirit of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit of God, before they were baptized. Now remember, when Moses smote the rock, the living water came. When Jesus, the rock represents Jesus, when Jesus died on that cross, the Holy Spirit was given. So, the rock, the rock had to be smitten first. The uh, apparently, how could how could these men have received the Holy Spirit if God did not also, by this de death symbol of Jesus Christ, forgive them of their sins, redeem them to Jesus Christ, so that He could put His Spirit on them, and then they were baptized. Oh, I sure, I'm sure. There's a way you can explain it away to counter what I'm saying. That's why I'm... Jesus, are you really real? What is truth? Like Pilate, I'm asking Jesus. What is truth? Is there such thing as truth? And Calvin. The mind of Augustine was influenced by Manichaean thought, and the minds of Luther and Calvin were influenced by Augustinian thought. Therefore, it's no surprise to see that Augustine denied free will just as the Manichaeans did, and Luther and Calvin denied free will just as Augustine did. The Manichaeans influenced Augustine, and Augustine influenced Luther and Calvin. There's no dispute over the fact that Augustine influenced Luther and Calvin. Luther was even an Augustinian monk, and the biographers of Luther and Calvin admit the fact that Augustinian doctrine was influential upon their... The doctrine of predestination and election. 
unconditional predestination and election has done the devil has used that to cause more terror, more torment, more doubts among sinners than any other heresy known to man, known to the Christ had the the doctor that 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 doctrine of unconditional election. Oh, have I been elected to be saved or not? Is it is there no is there any hope for me to serve seek God? Because what if I'm not elected to be saved? That has that that has been used by the devil to cause more conflict, more torment, more terror than. The not the doctor the Gnostic did. On their minds. William Carlos Martin said about Luther, the study of the Bible and of Augustine theology led him to the Redeemer. Johann Heinrich Kurtz said, Luther zealously studied the Bible along with the writings of Augustine. Thomas H. Dyer said in his biography of John Calvin. The doctrine of predestination, which is generally regarded as that of which principally characterizes Calvin, is in fact that of St. Augustine. Oliver Joseph. Now I will say this. When God created the universe, this is how, uh, this is how, this is how it is true, it, it is possible for the doctrine of, um, uh, what you call it, arbitrary election works. God knew when he created the universe. Everything that would happen, God arbitrarily made Paul. Paul, how how can Paul the apostle was Paul, and not how come? And and you 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 are you instead of how come you're not the you were not the apostle Paul and you're new and the apostle Paul was the Paul and not you. Why did God do that? That was all arbitrarily because there it was impossible. It, it was of necessity. Someone had to be Paul the Apostle. Someone had to be Adolf Hitler. Someone had to be you. Someone had to be me. And God knew who was going to be saved and who was not going to. And now I believe that some people God preordains to be saved. Like the Apostle Paul. They had no choice in the matter. But the rest is are uh, whosoever will let him come. But I believe even with Apostle Paul, God chooses men in such a way to not violate their free will. He just puts on, he, he, he just puts some more pressure. Everyone has a breaking point. God could put more pressure on some and force them to reach their breaking point where they realize their need for God. But he doesn't. Now why? That's up to him. But he is just whatever he does. I sure hope that justice includes making Calvin answer for his crimes of murder. And of Thatcher said, in theology, he, Calvin, was a close follower of St. Augustine. His influence was to revivify the ideas of St. Augustine and joining them to the main ideas of the Reformation, <sighs> embody them in the church he organized. The Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics said, Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, with minor divergences, agree in the reverting to St. Augustine on the main issues and in the supposed interests of evangelical piety. Luther actually referred to Augustine 13 times in his book, The Bondage of the Will. And Martin Luther got his nose dirty in human government. Martin Luther's hatred of the Jews is utterly detestable. Now I hope he has the answer to God for his hatred of the Jews. Son of a fucking son of a bitch. Hatred is the work of the flesh. That's what you get. What that's what you get when you try to mix the kingdom of the world with the kingdom of God, God and light. Oh, and in the works of Martin Luther, August. So the question is, according to the, should should Christians be involved in human government? is referred to 24 times in the Institutes of Christian Religion I'm by angry. John Calvin 
I'm angry. Two hundred and sixty-five times. Screw Since you, Luther God, and sometimes. Calvin were both students of Augustine and basically learned their theology from him, it's not surprising to find the remnants of Gnostic and Manichaean views in their theological writings. Martin Luther said, "Man has lost his freedom and is forced to serve sin." As true, Jesus did say. He that committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not forever. If the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I give the I give it that. And cannot will good. He sins and wills evil necessarily. Luther also stated, sin is his nature, and of himself he can do nothing but sin. In his institutes, John Calvin said that man does not have a free will in the sense of a free choice between good and evil, but he actually denied this altogether. Calvin paraphrases Augustine saying, Nature began to want liberty the moment the will was vanquished by the revolt into which it fell, by making a bad use of free will, lost both himself and his will. Free will, having been made a captive, can do nothing in the way of righteousness. Man at his creation received a great degree of free will, but lost it by sinning. The Christian spectator said, Augustine and Calvin and all of the reform. Okay, Adam and Eve had a choice. The same choice we do, we got today. Adam and Eve could have chosen to obey God, but they chose not to. We too have a choice. Obey God when you hear the gospel, get saved, or don't. So what's the fucking difference? Reformers taught the bondage or moral impotence of the will. While the early church wrote about the freedom of... The difference is Adam had not yet sinned. So sin was not in an equation. We have sin in an equation. That's the difference. The will. Martin Luther wrote a whole book called The Bondage of the Will. This shows a clear and radical departure from early Christianity. Charles Partey said, in his teaching on total depravity, now I believe that we have free will, but it's shackle, but it's a shackled free will. But we still have free will. Gravity and bondage of the will. Calvin is essentially following Augustine and Luther, and not creating a so-called Calvinistic doctrine. Luther actually defended his position against free will by saying Augustine is wholly on my side, and John Calvin. But is Jesus on your side, you son of a bitch? tried to dismiss the charge of being opposed to the early church by saying Augustine hesitated not to call the will a slave. He also said, lest he be charged with being opposed to all antiquity, let us hear Augustine in his own words. While Calvin tried to say that he was not opposed to all antiquity when it came to free will, what he meant was that he was not opposed to Augustine, because Augustine was the only exception. Calvin was opposed to all of the early church fathers except for Augustine when it came to the issue of free will. You hear that? They don't, they don't believe it because they don't want to believe it. They want to believe that Calvinist, Calvinist, a majority of Calvinists worship the tulip and not Jesus. Uh, so the Calvinists are more like the scribes and Pharisees who worship their doctrines rather than worshiping God. And I hope that I have to answer for it in the face of a God of wrath. He will. John Calvin said, All ancient theologians, with the exception of Augustine, are so confused, vacillating, and contradictory on this subject. Or maybe they know the truth better than you, you son of a bitch. That no certainty can be obtained from their writings. Calvin admitted, it may perhaps seem that I have greatly prejudiced my own view by confessing He finally speak the truth that all the ecclesiastical writers, with the exception of Augustine, have spoken too ambiguously or inconsistently on this subject that no certainty is attainable from their writings. The reason that John Calvin rejected all ancient theologians and dismissed their writings on free will, except for Augustine, is because all ancient theologians taught the freedom of the will, except for Augustine. Yeah. Gregory Boyd said, This in part explains why Calvin cannot cite anti-Nicene fathers against his libertarian opponents. Hence, when Calvin debates Pigouis on the freedom of the will, he cites Augustine abundantly, 
but no early church fathers are cited. George Predeman said, the peculiar tenets of Calvinism are in direct opposition to the doctrines maintained in the primitive church of Christ. All the ability of, of the mind to use massive denial to believe what it wants to believe. Just like the fucking sinners of the world. George Predeman said, There is a great similarity between the Calvinistic system and the earliest heresies. The reformers sought to return the church to early Christianity, but they actually brought it back to earlier heresies because they didn't go beyond Augustine. They didn't go far back enough. Rather than returning the church to early Christianity, they actually resurrected Augustinian Gnostic doctrine. And you wonder why Christianity today is such a wet noodle. Christianity today has no power. Why Jesus in the book of Revelation Thou hast little strength, but I have set before thee an open door. Oh, you fools! You fools! Not the Apostle Walmart must say, Oh, fools! Know ye not the truth? You fools! Methodist Quarterly Review said, at the Reformation, Augustinianism received an emphatic reinforcement among the Protestant churches. The Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics said, It is Augustine who gave us the Reformation. For the Reformation, inwardly considered, was just the ultimate triumph of Augustine's doctrine. The Reformation came, seeing that it was on its theological side, a revival of Augustinianism. The Reformation was to a great extent a revival or resurrection of Augustinian doctrine and a further departure from early Christianity. Gnosticism, Augustinianism, Lutheranism, Calvinism, they all have a lot in common. Augustinianism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism all teach Gnostic views of human nature and free will, but under a different name. It's the same old Gnosticism, but in a new wrapper. While other doctrines also seem to have originated within Gnosticism, no doctrine has spread so widely and with so... Jesus Christ, are you really real? Are you really true? Are you really true? You got to be. But are you really real? What is truth? ...much acceptance as the doctrine of man's natural inability to obey God. This doctrine has been taught by both Catholics and Protestants, by both Arminians and Calvinists. Consider the following facts that we have shown. Augustine's mind was greatly influenced by Manichaean thought on the topic of free will and human nature, and he clearly departed from the views of the early church. The minds of Luther and Calvin were highly influenced by Augustinian thought, and they admitted to departing from the views of the early church. And Augustine, Luther, and Calvin are undeniably the greatest contributors to Christian theology. Isn't it abundantly clear that Gnosticism or Manic... Maybe that explains why there's so little true love among Christians today. Do that Christians really follow the teachings of Jesus Christ or of Augustine? Paul Washer, Jesus Christ said, Him that asked for me, turn thou not away. If I, I, John, Paul Washer is a millionaire. If I asked him for a few thousand dollars so I could get my crowns and my teeth, would he give me the money as Jesus commanded? Or would he make it some lame ass excuse why he couldn't give the money? Jesus said, Okay, let me, let me turn, it's on the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, I'm looking that up. Get sit five twenty five verse forty one and afterward. Okay, now let's start in verse forty. Thirty nine, five thirty nine. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if any man will sue thee, 
at the law and take away thy coat. Let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So, Paul Washer, are you a hypocrite, or are you a follower of Jesus Christ, or are you a cherry picker follower of Jesus Christ? Picking those words which are not too hard to follow. Let's prove you by fire, Paul Washer. Paul Washer, I need a couple of thousand dollars. I need to get some crowns from my teeth. Can I have the money? Can I borrow from me? I'll pay you back. Now, if you're really a follower of Jesus, you'll give him the money. But if you are, if you don't, how can you, how dare you, how can you, if you don't, if, how can you call yourself a follower of Jesus? If you, if you dis, if you disobey one rule, you've broken all, you've broken them all. It says in the book of James. But if you've been, for, if you, you, Keep all the law, but if in one point you are guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if you do not kill, but commit adultery, you still have broken the, you've broken the whole law. So, Paul Washer, I, I'm asking you for a few thousand dollars so I can get my crowns for my teeth. And let's see if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ or a hypocrite. Manichaeanism has come into the church and is permeated Where is your faith? Views. The Gnostic doctrine... You believe your rewards are really going to come to you in the afterlife? Let's see if you really believe that. The book, writer of Hebrews says to the Christians, You joyfully took the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have endured substance. doctrine of the natural inability of man, or the bondage of the will, has crept into the church through a Trojan horse and has been masquerading as Christianity ever since. Gnostic views regarding... And what I speak is the truth or Jesus is not real. Human nature and free will have survived the centuries because Augustinianism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism have preserved it I'm and promoted angry. it. And while the doctrine of the natural inability of man has spread <clears throat> like a plague, finding acceptance in many churches... It's not taught in the Bible, and it's not found in the earliest writings of Christianity. Well, you could read some of the writings of Paul and wonder if that's tr so. What is truth? Like Paul, I'm asking Jesus, what is truth? Is there even such a thing as truth? Is heaven really forever? Because of uh, near-death experiences I've seen that conflict with one another. I, be, I don't believe in near-death experiences. I believe near-death experiences are produced by the mind. They're a little bonus before you die. Near-death experiences are shit. They're we've crap. covered a lot of ground. So in They're closing, lies. let's briefly summarize what we've learned. First, we saw that the Gnostics denied the freedom of man's will and taught that man was under a necessity to sin. W.F. Hook said, The Manichaeans so denied free will as to hold a fatal necessity of sinning. No, these quotes by these not uh, Calvinists used to terrify me until I read the early church fathers. Lyman Beecher said, The free will and natural ability of man were held by the whole church. Natural inability was to that of the pagan philosophers, the Gnostics, and the Manichaeans. We also learned that all of the early Christians before Augustine believed in the freedom of man's will, and that man had a choice between obedience and disobedience. Episcopius said, What is plainer than that the ancient divines, for 300 years after Christ, those at least who flourished before St. Augustine, Maintain the liberty of our will, or an indifference of two contrary things, free from all internal and external necessity. Dr. Wigger said, All the fathers agreed with the Pelagians in attributing freedom of will to man in his presence. I think there's a middle ground. I believe in free will, and I believe Calvinism and free will. Calvinism is a, to the far right. Pelagius is to, to the far left. Both of both, you need there's a middle ground of truth. Present state. We 
We showed that Augustine was a Manichaean for nine years and was even a member of their Gnostic sect. John K. Ryan and in his introduction. Okay, that's enough. 